you, Dr. Sanford, when I was given this book, I looked at the title and I thought, man, that's intimidating. You know, what do I know about the human genome? What do I know about genetic entropy? I, I, I knew a little bit about entropy, a little bit about genes, but I got to tell you, your book has been a, a revelation for me. And it's uh, written from your perspective as, um, as, a, as a prof with a background in, in, um, in, bi in biology or botany or... Well, my, my training was in agricultural research in genetics and involved crop improvement. So breeding improved crop plants and then later being involved in the genetic engineering of crop plants. Right. So, and genetic engineering, of course, is still a kind of a, 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 bad, a bad code word out there in the world, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I know countries in Africa, for instance, Zambia specifically, who won't allow mm -hmm. uh, genetically uh, modified uh, corn. Mm -hmm. to come to their nation as much as they need it because mm -hmm. they're afraid that if they eat this corn, they're going to grow horns or something. Right. Uh, there is a stigma attached to it. Yeah. Um, I, I actually uh, think that the engineering of crops is really crucial to feeding a hungry world, but, um, but I understand people's concerns. And I actually, since I really haven't been involved with it for over 10 years, I um, pretty much stepped back from that controversy. I, I guess I feel there's better... Uh, more urgent things to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. But in the process of this discipline and this work, you, uh, you have an insight into uh, the genome that is quite unique. Mm -hmm. Now, for the sake of uh, people who have not encountered that word before, what does genome denote? So the genome is the, all of our genetic material combined. So it's all the genes on all our chromosomes. And it's made up of approximately 3 billion letters, which is... Uh, a vast amount of information. It's like many, many sets of encyclopedias. And it's basically an instruction manual on how to build a human cell and how to build a human body. Or actually, more accurately, it's, it's, it's less like a book than a, um, than a computer program. It's like an operating system, but it's vastly superior to any operating system man has developed. Yeah, there's nothing that we've come up with yet that can come close, right? Nothing can come close. In fact, we, as every year, we realize that it's more and more marvelous uh, than we thought. Now, was it you or another one of the scientists that I'm interviewing who said if you were to unravel uh, our, uh, our DNA and, and, and put these ladders end to end, it would go around the earth something like three and a half million times or something? Uh, All the DNA in our body, that, yeah. that's true, but that's partly because we have so many cells in our body. Yeah, what, three trillion or something? Uh, I think over a hundred trillion cells. hundred trillion? Yes. Uh, but, um, you know, once you get into trillions, just oh. to say there's many trillions is enough. That's astonishing. Yeah, so we're, we are a galaxy of um, design and complexity and amazing functionality, but it's the genome that has all the information that enables that. So it's like the, it's, it's just an amazing uh, information system. How long has it been since the uh, genome was uh, fully mapped? Well, the genome was uh, largely completed uh, around 2000, 2001, um, but they've been still actually filling in the gaps. There are still parts of the genome that have not yet been sequenced. Wow. Yeah. Now, have you had anything to do with the uh the uh, unraveling of the map? Have you been involved at all on that no, level? No, I wasn't involved in the sequencing of the yeah. genome, but I was uh, very, uh, very excited to see it um, develop. Now, this happened uh, right in the middle of your career, or to maybe towards the end of your career. Mm -hmm. uh, as someone whose whole life has revolved around genetics, uh, has this thing uh, been a revelation to you, this, this genome? I th pretty much all the biologists and geneticists I know during the last 10 years, I think, have been awed by uh, the complexity and uh, the, the marvelous nature of the genome. Uh, bef when the genome was first unveiled, it was announced uh, to be largely junk. And that was consistent with kind of the philosophy. Junk of, DNA. Junk DNA was yeah. a dominant um, <clears throat> concept. In 2007, the ENCODE project was completed. That was phase two of the genome project. And the uh, the ENCODE project was looking at the functionality of the genome. And to everyone's surprise, this was a huge project. This involved hundreds of scientists and, and vast amounts of money, scientists from all over the world, to do the ENCODE project, just like the genome project. What they found was that uh, the genome is amazingly functional. And not, over 90% of the genome is actively transcribed, and that doesn't, 
there's probably more, but we have to study more carefully to find the function of the remaining part of the genome. And um, more than that, uh, the genome has multiple overlapping, overlapping messages. Try to imagine a book in a chapter, and that hidden, embedded in that chapter, in addition to the obvious meaning of the, of the words in the chapter, are other messages. And that even in the same sentences, there might be several messages embedded. Uh, and even more astounding is, you know, the DNA has two strands, one running one way and one running the other. For the longest time, they thought the one strand was just for replication and all the information was on the other strand. Just one strand had information. What they found with the ENCODE project was more than 50% of the genome, uh, both strands are read. So it's like reading a sentence forward, so it has one meaning, and reading it backwards, and there's another message there. So it's data compression on the most uh, sophisticated level. Wow. And, and as you suggest in your book, there, there may be other aspects to data compression that have yet to be discovered, like, like almost uh, several dimensions, you know, a three or four dimensional or whatever the case may be. It is multidimensional, and one of the things that DNA does, it, it, it's like a, 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 a tape with letters on it, and you can read it in a linear way, but it also folds up like origami, and you can make huge architectural structures that fill the genome, and the func we're just starting to understand that all that folding uh, is like uh, the folding of a protein, functional, and it carries information. Now, this has got to be a challenge to the evolutionary worldview, uh, where so much is credited to randomness and uh, length of time mm -hmm. and, and uh, natural selection over billions of years. Um, are those who are deeply committed to the evolutionary perspective uh, beginning to acknowledge that uh, these discoveries, especially this ENCODE project, is uh, information that they hadn't had to process before and it is impacting their worldview? Or are they saying, uh, no, it, uh, it's affirming our worldview? I don't think anyone's saying it affirms their worldview because mm. it's becoming extremely problematic to explain how the genome could arise and how these multiple levels of overlapping information could arise. Since our best computer programmers can't even conceive of overlapping codes, um, what we're seeing is, and, and our best, the genome dwarfs uh, all of the computer information technology uh, that man has developed. So I think that, yes, it's very problematic to imagine how you could achieve that through uh, random changes in the, in the code. Uh, it was, it's, a, you know, no one, th even computer viruses are designed. And so there's not a, it, within all the programs of your computer, there's not a single zero or one that's there by chance, and there's no junk DNA in these codes. Well, uh, more and more, the genome looks like a super, super set of programs, and it's very hard to imagine how that came together. It all, it, more and more, it looks like top-down design and not just bottom-up chance discovery of wake, making complex systems work. I love your, uh, <coughs> your metaphor of the uh, princess and the pea. Uh, as you try to explain for the average person like me what's going on here. Mm -hmm. uh, walk us through that illustration. Okay. Um, you know the story of the princess is the pea. I do. So, of course, uh, she proved her, her special noble character because even with many mattresses, she could still feel that there was a pea under her mattress. And that proved that she was royalty, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's a cute story. Um, in terms of genetics, what we have is a huge genome, three billion letters, and what we have are chance mutations in this information system, which would be like changing zeros and ones in a computer program. And so you have these, these mutations are overwhelmingly deleterious. You could imagine a zero or one change in a computer program would make it better. But it's just phenomenally unlikely. And so the same thing is happening in the genome, and the mutation rate is extremely high. So it turns out that we have uh, about three mutations every cell division in our body, which is just astounding. Which makes you and me both mutants. We're getting more mutant every day. <laughs> yeah. So we, we're adding about three new mutations per cell per day. It's just absolutely mm -hmm. astounding. Um, so all these mutations are coming in, and they have tiny effects. If you change one letter in a genome of three billion, how much of the information have you lost? Very little, but you have lost some information. If you don't stop this process, you're going to destroy all the information. If you scramble the letters of the book, eventually it will have no information. And so uh, um, 
The typical mutation has too small of an effect on our fitness or our total functionality to be measurable. Now, we have some mutations where you can see an effect, like hemophilia, and you say, okay, that person has a mutation, there's a specific letter change that causes a severe disease. But the typical mutation is not detectable in any way by any medical technology. We can see that a genome has changed a letter, but we can't know how that's affected the workings of that person. And so the princess and the pea analogy is saying, uh, mother nature, which or natural selection, mm. is the princess, and there are these tiny changes, many levels removed. Like Braille, you say in your book. Right. So um, basically, selection happens for the whole individual. Yeah. So I, I'm 100 trillion cells, and I contain, uh, in every cell, there's 6 billion nucleotides. And so uh, Mother Nature is going to decide if my body is going to be selected or not, if to the extent that selection works at all. And so um, Mother Nature can't see a single nucleotide change. She's going to change. She's going to choose my whole genome. I have good genes and bad genes mixed together, and she's just going to say at the at the whole organism level, there's either survival or reproduction, which is survival or there is um, death or non-reproduction. And uh, the idea that Mother Nature can sort out what's happening at just above the atomic level as these letters change within our genome is really unthinkable. Yeah. Um, and and in, in a sense, this is how the sort of the classical um, evolutionary um, thinking has gone, at least as I was taught it when I was in school. But um, you're, you're really looking at, uh, way above the subatomic level. You're looking at someone who's got five fingers, someone who's got six fingers, or whatever the case may be. Right. And, and through natural selection and survival of the fittest, mm -hmm. uh, the person who is most capable of dealing with environment and all of that wins. But what you're saying is um, it's way beyond that. There's, mm -hmm. uh, there, there's a, a, a braille system, as you say, beneath mm -hmm. those mattresses. And um, somehow that has to be detected. It has to be detected, but it's inconceivable that it it's could be It's inconceivable it could be detected. And so uh, here's another uh, example would be um, if, if you go to a middle school biology class, they would present it as in a very simple way. Where you have a group of organisms and two or three of them are mutant, they have some dysfunction, and one or two of them is extra good because it's had a beneficial mutation. So you just select away the bad individuals and let the best individual have extra children, and it's just all going to keep getting better. The reality is everybody's mutant, mm. and, uh, and basically all the differences, they're mass, everybody carries tens of thousands of mutations, and the differences, each mutation has a minuscule effect, immeasurably small. So that the selection process is nothing to really grab hold of. Right. Yeah. No foothold. Now, your book is called Genetic Entropy, which by its very title suggests something stunning. Um, so much is predicated, again, on the evolutionary perspective, on um, new information being added, uh, mm -hmm. of uh, new things being created. The point you make on the genetic level is that there's nothing new being created. Rather, what has been created is we're actually losing. Mm -hmm. Entropy. There's this principle of uh, things slowing down, and you actually suggest in your book that just as we readily accept uh, the universe's heat death one day, mm -hmm. one day uh, in the far future mm -hmm. we, we we undergo a, a, a gene death. We mm -hmm. uh, the human race no longer mm -hmm. will have enough to to survive. Right. Now, is is this news? Uh, are there others who are saying this? Others who are admitting this? Or are you on the, uh, on the cutting edge of something here? Uh, how, how, is, how is this thesis seen by your fellow scientists? Right. So it's kind of a trade secret amongst population geneticists. Any really well-informed population geneticist understands that man is degenerating. Uh, and so uh, basically you can find great quotes. Uh, there's a, a, a paper written uh, a while back by a, a prominent population geneticist. And the title of the paper is, Why Aren't We Dead 100 Times Over? And he's basically addressing the problem. Things should be going down, not up. And so in deep geological time, we should have been extinct a long time ago. Um, uh, a more recent paper by Michael Lynch, just published just a year and a half ago, uh, looks at the human mutation problem. And he concludes that uh, the human race is degenerating at 1 to 5% in terms of loss of fitness 
per generation. That's the, for the human race is degenerating rapidly, is what he concludes, and it could be as high as 10%, depending on exactly what the mutation rate is. So he's acknowledging the problem, and he's saying in, a, in, in, a, in the relatively near future, we will see significant impairment of the human, of human functionality. And so this is really uh, one of the population geneticists I was speaking with said, basically every human geneticist acknowledges that the human race is degenerating. But if, if, if those stats are even close to being correct, if you project backwards, th that means that the human race is a lot younger than uh, we have been led to believe it is. Well, you'd think, you'd think that that would be a logical train of thought. That's why we should have been dead a hundred times over. That's what Kondrashov is basically saying. Yeah. Why aren't we dead a hundred times over? He would, he would definitely believe that that's not true, that, we're, that the, we trace back to the first bacterium, which you know, evolved maybe four billion years ago. And yet, if it's down, not up, how can that be? And so, um, most of the population geneticists who would acknowledge that we have a huge degeneration problem, imagine, well, it couldn't have been that way in the past, so selection must have been much more efficient in the past. So maybe if we step, stop taking care of the ill or helping the weak, perhaps we could get more uh, natural selection and perhaps stop the problem. Well, there's a fine line between that and uh, World War II eugenics. So I, I, the eugenics philosophy is just under the surface within yeah. the evolutionary community, and uh, they, I'm sure that they're thinking about it, but I'm sure that they don't want to go uh, talk about it. Um, the problem is, I, I've looked, I've spent years looking at this, and we've done very careful numerical simulations, increasing the amount of death and uh, increasing the intensity of selection doesn't stop it. The problem is so fundamental that, that just increasing selection pressure does not solve it. It doesn't even come close to solving it. This is the essence of aging. And so one of the things that uh, Michael Lynch in his recent paper mentioned was he said, because of the nature of this degenerative process in our own body, there is no prospect for any type of scientific breakthrough to significantly extend our lifespan beyond what it is. That's really fundamental and it's very personal because we are experiencing genetic entropy personally. No one can contest that. Personal genetic entropy is an uncontestable fact that no scientist on the planet can deny because it is why we die. And, and so what's happening is every gene in every chromosome of every cell in my body is mutating. And so that guarantees my aging and my death. But the problem is that these mutations that are accumulating in my body, some of them are transmitted to my children. And so, in fact, um, I take the genes, all the mutations that I inherited from my ancestors, which is tens of thousands of deleterious mutations in my body, and then I add my own contribution to that, about a hundred new mutations at least, and pass it on to the next generation. So what we have here is not only the, this, this deep, the kind of a personal tragedy, this is what causes us to die, uh, but it's passed on to our children. And so it's a tragedy for all of humanity and it keeps getting worse. It means that we are a perishing people living in a dying world. And that is so profound and so it makes the, the, the need for salvation and a savior so personal and so immediate because there's no circle of life where things just keep staying the same, and it's not an upward spiral of evolution, things keep getting better and better. It is a downward spiral, exactly as described in Scripture. And so it's, uh, my research, I thought, would, um, I realized it had major implications for evolution, but I had no, um, I couldn't have guessed how profound the biblical implications are, how profoundly uh, the evidence supports the biblical perspective of a dying universe and a dying world and that we are dying because of the fall and that we desperately, our only hope, our only hope is Christ.